Hello and welcome to Just Keep Writing. A podcast for writers. By writers. To keep you writing. I'm Marshall. I'm Nick. I'm Maurice. And I'm Will. And we're back. We're back with the uh, infamous uh, Maurice Broadus has joined us once again. And I'm excited. I, I love having you on the show. Welcome back. How are you, sir? Oh, I'm doing great. I'm glad, so glad to be back with you guys. As, <laughs> as you can tell, since I'm back with you guys so often. <laughs> For the record, this is episode five with us. <laughs> yes. Oh, you're and, keeping uh, track? Oh, I'm keeping track. It's longer than that one. <laughs> it's actually... I thought, is this not, number six? I thought it was well, six. It's six. Well, okay. So uh, if we count the World Con as... Even though we put out as one episode, that was twice. Is that uh, what you're okay. counting? No. We're doing math for, at the top um, of the show. It seems there was yeah, no problematic con. for writers. Mm-hmm. Not going to end well. There was no, no con. No con. Mm-hmm. And there I'd was another that one, one with Maurice. Oh, oh right. The Mocon okay. one. Yeah. Then there was the usual one. suspects. Uh, mm-hmm. World Con, Sweep of Stars, and now his new book, Unfatable. Way to segue, Will. I don't know right. any you. of that. You, you can listen to a bunch of writers do math. <laughs> you can't tell. All right. I'm not good at that. <laughs> so we're back. Okay. Well, I'm going to turn it over to you in a minute, but um, at the top of the show really quick, because I want to make sure we do this, please make sure um, if you want to support our show, patreon.com, of course, uh, slash just keep writing and give us a five star rating and write a review and we'll read it out on the show. So thank you for everybody who does that and supporting the show. We really appreciate you. So before we got into it, I figured I'd throw that out there. All right, Will, you're up. All right, Maureen. So it is our infamous question. Um, I want you to Mm -hmm. describe writing unfatable in three words. Did you see it coming this time? I did. So I'm 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 still not ready, but I'm 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 better. Uh, Inspiring, heartbreaking, challenging. All right, let's unpack those three words. Sorry, I had to write them down. Um, Let's talk about inspiring. Why was it inspiring? So uh, two ways. So one, it was inspired uh, by one of my former middle school students. Her her name actually is Bella. And uh, so I teach at a a middle school. And uh, one year at the middle school, I did a creative writing club. And, And Bella was one of the people who was in my creative writing club. And, uh, and so that, you know, that was like four, four years ago. Uh, and I'm still mentoring like three of those people that were in my creative writing club and Bella's one of them. And, uh, and one time she was actually sitting next to me when, uh, I was getting the emails from my uh, publisher and they were like, well, um, we're looking for you to do a follow-up to usual suspects, you know, what do you have for ideas? Da, da, da. And so uh, Bella's like, oh, man, Mr. Broadus, that, that's got to be hard. And I'm just like, hard? Let me just type this in real quick. There, I just pitched you as a book. And I just looked around the classroom. I was like, I'm just going to pitch a bunch of these, <laughs> a bunch of my chuckleheads in my room right now. I'm going to start <laughs> pitching them as books. And so uh, I think I ended up pitching five book projects to them. And they and then they came back. And, and this was kind of a testimony to, uh, well, I'm not really a testimony to Bella. Bella happened to still be next to me because they responded like within a half hour. And uh, and they were like, oh, this Bella character, now she sounds really interesting. I think that's the book we ought to go to. And then, you know, then she's all, hey, Mr. Broadus, I'm really interesting. You need to write about me. And so I'm like, <laughs> okay, great. So and on, on one level, so the book was inspired. And another level, it's inspiring um, because one of the things I wanted to capture with the book is the whole idea of agency and how you are never – too young to take agency over not just your life, but your 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 role in community, your place in community, your your ability to impact community. And so, uh, with with the the lead character uh, Bella Fades, you know she's a, a middle school student. She's looking to start her own arts. Well, it's summer vacation. She's looking to you know get a, maybe a little art project going. Um, but then comes up against this whole, all right, this, these institutions standing in front of her, you know, trying to basically preventing her from just doing her one little project. But so she's a, a middle school student and now she's up against basically the systems <laughs> that, govern, that govern the world. Uh, but she still has agency and she can still she can still challenge the powers that be. She can still speak truth to power. She can still act out of her own power. So. 
in that regards, you know, it was also inspiring. And heartbreaking. Heartbreaking uh, because of uh, the uh, of what turns out to be Bella's backstory. Um, as I was uh, figuring out Bella's backstory, you know, some of the things that, uh, you know, shape her into the person that she is. I mean, there's a lot of, of heavy themes that uh, uh, go into, apparently is becoming the hallmark of my work, but <laughs> there are a lot of heavy themes that, that go along with this. So one of them is homelessness. Uh, another one is uh, uh, mental illness. And, uh, you know, so these are some of the things that ends up, she ends up having to wrestle with the, the things that have impacted her life and impacted her journey um, that, are, that, are, that are at turns heartbreaking. And uh, um, yeah, there, there, there is a particular chapter in the book that, uh, <laughs> uh, so I'm a personal assistant and, and his name's Rodney. And so he, he's, he's read the, the several iterations of this book, but every time he gets to that chapter, he sends me a text and cusses me out every single time. So uh, he's like, I'm crying again because of you. And then profanity. So uh, <laughs> heart- heartbreaking is a, <laughs> is a word. And challenging. Challenging because of, I mean, in some ways, this was a tricky, tricky book to write. Um, and so because uh, like uh, there was a there came a point in the book where, uh you know, all the elements were there and I knew all the elements were there, but the book was just fundamentally broken. Right. And, uh, and I knew it was broken. My editor knew it was broken. Um, but we all could go, Oh, there is, it is so close, but something's just off in terms of, uh, we don't know something's just off. And so, uh, so the challenge was in trying to fix that. And what, what, and uh, what was suggested that I do, uh, it felt like a. It felt like creating the out, like reverse. It felt like reverse engineering the book, right? So as I end up going through the whole book and on note cards, on a series of note cards, writing out all right, this scene. Here, here's the scene that's going on. Here's what's going on in this chapter. And I broke down each chapter by scene, um, and then spread all the chapters with all the scenes along the floor. So mm-hmm. now I now, so now my floor is covered in three by five cards. And then I went and just rearranged the entire book using the three by five cards until I could see. I was like, wait a second. I see the problem now. And so I started rearranging it. So I'm like, here, let me tell the story in this particular order. Um, and just, I basically, I just moved the threads around, moved, this, moved all the different elements around until finally I was like, wait a second. I think I, think I found a way to, to tell this story. Mm-hmm. Um, and so then I, I basically put, put the book back together that way. That built up several muscles for me when it came came to writing, because uh, that whole idea of what it lo- looks like to reverse engineer a book um, and then re- rearrange it by scene, and, you know, until I, and, and just keep playing with it because it's three by five cards. So I'm, now I'm just playing with the book, literally. I'm just rearranging stuff, rearranging stuff like, hey, can I tell it in this order? And, hey, can I tell the story in this order? Um, and then it was like, oh, wait. Once I finally got the order and like, I, I kept taking pictures at different stages too. It's like, <laughs> this is one way the book could look. And then, you know, so I wouldn't forget. And then I'd play, play with it again. So one, there was a challenge of unraveling my own book, but then two, it was the whole idea of like, you know what, when all said and done, this is what, this is the joy of writing. I'm literally having fun playing with story. Uh, and so I literally have a, a puzzle in front of me and I'm like, the, the, the puzzle is story. Story is a puzzle. And I'm just trying to figure it out. And I'm like, literally, I'm just down on the floor. I'm moving stuff around and I am having the time of my life. You know, it's like, I know there's a story in here somewhere. Let me just try and arrange it and, and unlock it by getting everything in the right order. So it was challenging. And yet even in the challenge, it was, it was great. It was, I had a ball. So my next question is, um, pitch us the book for anyone who uh, wants to know about the book. Uh, what was your pitch for it? Unfatable is about the uh, adventures, the, the secret origin story of uh, a neighborhood detective named Bella Fades, uh, a young lady who is uh, basically trying to mind her own business. But uh, due to some of the, the people and forces she comes up against in her neighborhood, uh, she comes under the, uh, the auspices of a, a figure I call a retired Batman. <laughs> uh, who uh, a, a private investigator takes her under uh, his wing and uh, he begins to train her in what it looks like to uh, investigate on her own and on her own terms. And so Unfatable is about a, a young lady 
uh, operating uh, in her own power, finding her agency and speaking truth to power. Oh, I should write that down. That was good. That's not, that's not, that was really good. That was excellent. Thankfully, we recorded as well. I can kick that back to you. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. Do that. Please. <laughs> this is recorded. You don't need to write. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the book was originally published in 2019. May of 2019. That's what my uh, little research has said. I know you... Um, oh, wait. So, unfatable? Yeah. No. The... Usual suspects, usual oh, suspects. Usual suspects. That's what oh, I yes, yes. Yeah. Usual okay. suspects came out in 2019, and we're approaching 2022. Now, it's been a while since you had a middle grade book um, come out. So, I want to ask you, what was it like? What did you learn from going from the usual suspects, your first middle grade um, debut, to then now unfatable? What did you learn about middle grade in general? Well, one thing I learned is my middle school students will never be impressed with me. So <laughs> there, there, there was that. They are completely unimpressed with uh, me doing middle grade books. Uh, that's um, <laughs> so that's one thing. Uh, oh, one of the things I learned is, uh, you know, it's a continual challenge. You know, pe- people, you know, there's sometimes when you'll, you'll hear people talk about something like middle grade, but like, oh, I could write one of those and da 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 da. I'm like, really? Could you? Because this is hard. This is hard. Uh, Maurice, can know. I ask you a question real quick? Cause, sure. Because I've taught middle school before and I know uh-huh. how it feels to be, have students just ridiculously unimpressed with the things you say and who you are and whatever else. But with the they're unimpressed with the story that you produce ultimately is that what you're saying or was it more was it more just like they're like okay whatever mr brought you wrote a book it's more the latter um (laughs) in fact so there was it's like okay okay mr brothers blah 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 you do do this thing um and so, but like there was one time when uh, there's an organization here in town called Indiana Humanities is a branch mm-hmm. of obviously a branch of NEA and all, or NEH and all that kind of stuff. But uh, they came in to, to film uh, like a mini documentary on me as a, as a writer. They want to mm-hmm. see me at work at school and stuff like that. And so the cameras roll in and, and they're, they're filming, they're asking me questions and all that kind of stuff. And then when everybody rolls out, the, uh, the students are in my room and they're like, wait, Mr. Broadus, are, are you famous? <laughs> And I'm like, ah, you literally see all these books I've written around me, you know. All right, you know what? I, I you know, I'm not doing, I'm not doing this with y'all today. Um, so, so there is that. But then, um, hey, I had a I had an answer here for a second ago. Um, well, what was the question? Oh, them and why they're not impressed know? with you? <laughs> well, they're middle schoolers. They're never going to be impressed with me, but. <laughs> Uh, okay, but so for example, and so the, oh, so so like one thing. Here's one thing I learned is like you know I live in well any any writer you you can sort of get into a spot where you got get scared of reviews. It's like okay, my book's coming out. I want to know it gets received well. Da, 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 you know, and it, there is that certain fear that you're living with as a as a as a creative. Um, but if you want to talk fear, if you want to talk you know, going to that precipice and, and living on the edge. Hand your manuscript to a middle school student. Mm. Right? Because that'll take the... F- Look here, if the New York Times was to roll up a review of me today, it's like, whatever. Because <laughs> I gave Phoebe Harp a copy of my book early on, and she was just like, hey, Mr. Broaddus, I got you. I'll be your editor. I'll let you know what's working, what's not working. She comes back the next day and is like, hey, Mr. Broaddus, I, I circled all the boring parts for you just so you can rewrite them. And my manuscript was like dripping red. I'm like, every page had stuff circled on it. And I'm just like, are you kidding me right now? She goes, yeah, you can thank me later. And uh, I'm like, middle schoolers, unimpressed with everything. Yeah. But uh, but that's also what I love about them. They're just so real and so raw at all times. And I'm just like, nah, nah, I'm, I'm here. I'm here for it. So, uh, so we get to have these sort of conversations. And it's like, so one of the things I learned is, A, and don't have fear. <laughs> and then also every now and then they will give you grudging respect. Cause uh, you know, one of my students picked up my book and started reading chapter one and was just like, 
oh, Mr. Broadus, you think this is how we talk? This ain't how we sound. This ain't how we talk. Blah, 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 blah. And, the, and kept running her mouth, just straight running her mouth the whole period. <laughs> and then the bell rings, she gets up and leaves. And I'm just like, wait, where are you going with the book? She goes, oh, no, I was going to keep reading. I'm like, oh, <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. So, uh, so yes, yeah, so I don't know if I've actually, you know, answered the question, but I do know that, man, I've learned to be fearless. I've learned, uh, I've learned to love middle schoolers all the more. And I've also learned, you know, man, and it's like a continual lesson, just how smart these kids are. These kids are smart and, uh, and we underestimate them a lot. <laughs> and so, uh, so that's, that's, that, That'd be probably my continuing lessons when it comes to a writing writing middle school book. And like, do not underestimate how smart these kids are. I want to ask a publishing question. Mm-hmm. What is the difference, would you say, in writing a middle grade book versus an adult book? What have you noticed that on the publishing side of things is eye opening was eye opening to you? Mm. Um. Huh. Well, I know working with my editors has always been a treat because, you know, they just know this stuff so well. I mean, it's like one of those things where it's like learning to trust uh, the team around you. It's like, like I have a solid editorial team and, and they have ways of just drawing the best work out of me, um, which isn't to say my adult uh, editors, you know, can't do that, but, uh, with the middle grade books, it's, it's always been a sort of special roller coaster, right? That where it's, uh, this whole, oh man, it just, it so much keeps coming down to voice. Um, and, and so, so this is my second middle, middle grade book. Um, so it's not like I have a 20 year history in this. I have a three, I have a three year history in this. And, and so in a lot of ways, I feel like it's like a running tutorial that's going on with this book. Man, just listening, listening to them talk about middle school books and and middle school readers, and the the whole idea of just like, no, no, there is a particular audience you are writing to. Like my adult sci fi stuff, I'm just I'm I'm writing, and it's just sort of I'm writing it, and I'm just throwing it out there. Uh, but it's like, no, with the middle school books, you were writing to a very specific audience, a uh, very specific readership, and and you have to you have to stick the landing, <laughs> uh, or or the, or you will lose them quickly. And, uh, and that, that is the lessons I learned writing that is, are, are, they literally are lessons I can transfer to other aspects of my writing, which is like, Hey, you know what? Uh, who is my audience I'm writing to with this, with this other project? How do I keep them in mind? How do I center them as, as, a, as I'm, I'm, as I'm doing the writing? Yeah, it's, a uh, no, I, yeah, I just, it's a tricky, it's a tricky thing, but yeah, it's a, it's a good thing. It stretches all my muscles. So speaking of stretching your muscles, how was it writing, you know, with the usual us suspects, they were boys uh, yeah. getting into trouble. And now you're writing from the perspective of a, of a girl. What was the challenge, but at the same time, what was refreshing about it? Right. And, uh, you know, it's not, it's not like I want to foray into a, you know, talking about, you know, generalizations about gender and everything, but man, middle school boys are just messy. They are messy. <laughs> uh, and, and their journeys are messy. They, ah, uh, goodness, <laughs> their ideas, what constitute a good idea for middle school boys. You're just sitting there going, like, what, what dictionary are you using where you, the word good means that, you know? So, you know, that, that's what it's like working with middle school boys and middle school girls though. It's just like, Oh wait, no, now, Ah, it's a whole different toolkit, uh, right? There's a, a level of sophistication and craftiness that I'm just like, oh, man, there, there's a lot going on there. Um, being able to, to and, and then plus their, their emotional lives. You know, what's it like to interrogate each of their emotional lives? Because with the usual suspects, uh, you know, obviously there's a rich interiority to, to all of them also, but it's now, it's, it's, it's kind of like, how, how does it, you get inside them, but it's like, Middle school boys, there are ideas of masculinity that they're trying to uh, work within or define or 
think that they should operate within, but they don't know what exactly the rules that they are, are working in. They have these vague ideas of what it means to be a man ish uh, versus, you know, you come down fadeable and it's the same sort of thing, but it's like a different script that they're, that they're operating from. And so, yeah, walking that line is uh is fraught i will say that it is it is fraught but then luckily i also have middle school uh students who will gladly correct me when i am wrong when they go mr broadus what are you on right now and i am absolutely open to their their uh we'll call them editorial comments <laughs> we, we can call it that but uh uh but that's one thing that i love about writing though because i think so many times we think about writing as a solitary thing and it doesn't, it doesn't have to be. That's just some people's practice and, and how they want about crafting it. But like for me, it's always been an interactive thing. So, you know, me showing some pages to some of my students, one, it shows me it's like, Hey, I'm trying to, Hey, I'm trying to get this right. And this should get model for you what it means for you to get stuff right when you turn in your writing assignments. But then two, can this open up a conversation between us of, of what these things could look like? What does it look like for you to operate in your agency? You know, that, that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, it's just, a, it, it, it was very, it was very different process. Uh, that's the short version. It was very different. <laughs> I, would, I do know this, though. Uh, girls have me wrapped around their fingers, and they know it. They absolutely know <laughs> it. I, I'm so glad I have two sons and not two daughters or even one daughter because – me and my wife were just talking about this er- earlier tonight. Is that like you would be, or she was telling this to me, like you would be useless with girls because mm-hmm. they have they have you wrapped around their fingers in like no time. And I'm just like, you are so right. <laughs> <laughs> Question: mm-hmm. We know going into talk about distractions in middle school age boys. He's right? two years away from being middle grade. Go away. Um, <laughs> We know the usual suspects had a high influence of your two boys when they were about that age. How much influence did your experience with raising middle school boys have on this story? Ooh. Um. <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting because uh, the main influence is the whole idea of being, being a big brother or being a brother, period, actually. Um, and so, uh, in, in Unfadeable, there is a, a young man, his name is Aries, who, uh, uh, basically befriends Bella. Well, not befriends Bella. They fall into this weird high sibling energy relationship. And so what, what, it, what it, so one, I'm drawing on the relation, the energy between my two boys, their, their sibling energy is, is, is next level. Uh, it is next level. They are now 19 and 20. But uh, they are still best friends. They are still, we were planning a family vacation together and they're both like trying to, they're, they're like, okay, so if we bring our Xboxes and I'm like, why are you bringing your Xboxes? Like, so we can play games. And I'm like, with each other, we're literally going on vacation with each other. Uh, but you bring your Xbox so you can play with each other in the same room. Uh, and, and so it's just like, but you know what? Siblings. And uh and so being able to watch that and, and, and raising boys, you know, raise, or raising two, you know, siblings, you know, that, that impacts, uh, what, you know, that's one of the things I bring to, to bear and unfadeable, but the, actually the bigger thing is what's it look like is, is, is my mentoring relationship with, with different students. So, uh, I, I, like I said, right now I'm mentoring probably a half dozen students right now. Um, outside of my actual students at school. So, I mean, we're talking about people who've like reached out and say they, either through community work or through uh, wanting to be writers. You know, I have about a half dozen local teen mentees. And so so that idea of what it does look like to mentor a middle schooler, um, that probably ha- probably has a greater impact on, on the dynamics that go on in the book than, than anything else because uh, mentoring is an is a interesting dance, uh, you know, especially, you know, if I, I even look back now, like I, you know, I'm 50 plus years old and I'm, you know, talking to these teens and it's like, Oh, and then, but we have all these very individual relationships of like, Oh no, this is, this is who you are. And all the relationships are born out of knowing who each of these students are as themselves, not as a, you are a male or you are a female. No, no, you are who you are. 
I have to learn that. We have to have that relationship based off of who you are. Um, and then being able to, you know, put that into a book form that that's, that was actually my, my big fun for, uh, for Unfatable is watching the, the, the mentor relationship play out. You know, my next question is about art and Bella is a graffiti artist. And when people sometimes hear the word graffiti, they don't always necessarily think of art. I'm going to say this. Maybe people won't like what I say this. I find it white people don't <laughs> like calling graffiti art. Um, you know, like I grew up in a neighborhood where graffiti was way more important as far as an artistic statement mm. than a painting hanging in a museum. Even though a lot of times, um, I think when you're an artist, a graffiti art was kind of the first art that I actually experienced as a kid. And like, I understand all about now, you know, I went to college and I took art courses and um, about how it actually stems down from art in general, right? But you chose graffiti art uh, specifically. So I want to talk about that choice and how it informed the story itself. Yeah. So there was a couple reasons for, for that. So graffiti, you're right. Graffiti is a, a form that not, not many folks, well, a lot of folks have issues with because they don't see it as art. They see it as destruction of private property. Um, and so that trumps any art uh, aspect to it. So, so there's that that th that level of it. There's a the level of uh, I have several uh, friends who are graffiti artists, and they have they have educated me on what does it look like, you know, what what how graffiti is art and and what that looks like and, and the process and and how they do their tags, why why they choose different spots, um, and just the. So my thing is uh, is like I love art. I mean, obviously, I, I you, when I talk about writing, I'm passionate about writing. I love writing. Um, but I, I will talk to any artist about their art practice. Um, so if you're doing art at a high level, I'm going to learn from you, uh, no matter what that art form is. And so I, so I love swapping these stories with, with other artists. And so talking to graffiti artists about about their art, and it's 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 amazing. It's a joy. And so then being able to like transfer that over to uh, to to Bella, um, I'm like, this is a this works. So when it works as, as, as I'm like, oh yeah, I get to discuss art and uh, and this whole, whole aspect of, of different folks who I've bumped into a community inspired by their, how they do their thing. But also it sort of defines Bella in a lot of ways too. She's a person who is a, a who loves to create beauty um, and loves to take, take places that people have overlooked uh, or, have abandoned or have forgotten about and um, or have been run down and then create beauty in those spaces. And I think that says a whole lot about that character um, in terms of, you know, for, for about who she is and how she wants to move through the world, because she is creating beauty in these lost places and these abandoned places. And that says a lot about her. You know, I think it's really interesting when, um, he said, you know, some people don't view graffiti as art because it's defacing property. When, when you look at the history of graffiti art, I found it to be a form of resistance and taking back your community. Mm -hmm. And it always seems, and I feel like this is a theme about um, the so-called uh, good people trying to keep order in an environment, but wound up to be hurting more than helping. And you see a lot of this, I think, throughout the book. This is how I kind of viewed it, just from it. But I want to read a section from the opening of the book, because I really feel like this is such a masterclass on voice, and really, like, the character just comes out so strong. I jump behind a pillar as soon as I see the police car slow rolling down Clifton Street. I recognize the officer driving it by his trifling mustache, looking like he pasted squirrel fur on his upper lip. <laughs> he busted me a few times for tagging. Only once he rounds the corner and the car grumbles safely out of sight do I creep back around to the front. Middle school might be out, but it's not summer until my first tag of the year. 
that first paragraph I feel like is so powerful and there's so much energy behind it. Um, well, I and want like Marie talk- said earlier, voice. I mean, the voice yeah. is so clear in that paragraph. So sorry, Will. I, I you know, like I said, no, no, I don't no, have no, the no. arc. So. Geek out. <laughs> no, geek out. I mean, I, I'm, I think I'm blown away by that paragraph. <laughs> I want to talk about that paragraph for a minute because I think a lot of times as writers, you know, was that your first paragraph that you first wrote? Like how many times did you go o- over that opening? <laughs> because it was like, so like crystal clear, like, Oh my gosh, I see this girl in my head and she's awesome. Yeah. Um, because that was the first thing that came to my head. Cause I was just like, if what is it, what could sum up her in one scene in one flourish, you know, how could I introduce her? And you'd go, Oh, Oh, I know exactly who I'm dealing with. <laughs> and uh, and that was literally the first scene that came to my mind was her. I was like, I need to see her in her element doing what she loves to do. That's going to tell me. Yeah, that tells me a lot about any of Like when I see y'all doing what you do in your element, you know, there's a, when I see you, you know, you're, you're immersed in it. You're doing what you love. You, you, you have faded out because you've now entered into the special zone. And it's just like, I just I could just sit there and just watch you guys work endlessly because as artists, when we hit that spot, we are being fully who we are. Right. And so with her, that's what I, that's what I wanted to capture is like her in her element doing her thing. That is, that is her freedom. That is her joy. That is, she's just going to radiate that. And then plus she, you know, runs her mouth because middle school students. So <laughs> I want to talk about this um, broken places. When people come from quote unquote broken backgrounds, there's a complexity to Bella that I found really interesting um, because she has a lot of strength, but you also see her grapple a little bit of her place. You know, how do you think kids can see themselves in the story and also grapple with the real life uh, situations that they're in that most adults don't pay attention enough to recognize. Yeah. Um, I I don't think kids would have any trouble at all seeing themselves or their friends in that because they're privy to the fact that this is what they're all going through. I mean, one one of the things we end up talking to our our students often uh, about is the whole idea of, You know, you have to be careful about your words with other people because you don't know what they're going through. You don't know what their story is. Uh, As teachers, we do. We we are sometimes more informed by what's going on with with their family lives and things like that. But uh, but even we aren't always going to know what's going on with with the students. And so you know, I look at over even over the course of this past year, some of the so much tragedy has hit some of uh, some of my students. And that's not even including the pandemic, but so much tragedy and, and violence have touched so many people's lives. Um, so much that they are own, so much of their own persons that they're wrestling with their own, you know, quote unquote weakness or, or shortcomings that uh, that they're struggling with. I mean, that's that's just the reality of life that we tend to go, oh, oh. Actually, I, I don't know. I think we are quick to overlook it about middle school students because we so want them to just be children. We want them to just be, you know, hey, stay young as long as you can, you know, enjoy your youth as long as you can. But life doesn't always allow that. Uh, that's a luxury. That's a privilege. And uh, and so sometimes life intrudes on, on on their ability to stay innocent for as long as possible. And so I think the students, the students will recognize that a lot. Uh, in their lives and their, in their friends' lives. You know, and I want to ask you, like, when I would hear people say that as a kid, uh, you know, stay young and like, you know, um, as long as you can, I, it blows my mind personally. I mean, this is specifically, I think, because of the way in which I grew up and the neighborhood I grew up in, because I went to a private school because my parents wanted me to, you know, kind of be away from things to an extent. Mm -hmm. Um, my question is that why are we constantly, it's like when we want kids, like you see this as a teacher, we want kids to quote unquote, remain innocent, 
But does that innocent equate silence of the things that are actually happening? Because it seems like a lot of the adults, what I love about this story is Bella is so smart and the adults, it's not that they're dumb, but they're not actually seeing things as they are, you know? And I, I feel like that they're failing her in a lot of ways. Yeah, because they, when, when we when we look at students, when we look at young people, it's through this lens of how we want it to be for them, as opposed to just seeing them. So, like, so for example, like one of my credos in just in in, in life is never lose track of the person in front of you. And so, what, what that looks like in you know, there are two hundred and fifty middle school students at, at my school, which means. F- I have 250 curricula that I'm juggling in my head because I want it because everything should be tailored to the person who's in front of me. And it becomes easy to go. I mean, some of it just comes from a good space, which is we just want the best for all of these, for all of them, right? We just want the best for them. We want to preserve their innocence. We want to keep the, 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 the realities of the world away from them for as long as possible. So, I mean, so there's that aspect to it. But in doing so, there's also a certain amount of denial there also, which uh, which denies the person in front of them and denies the fact of life is hard, <laughs> you, you know, mm-hmm. and, and life is hard and it, and, and it can touch them despite our best wishes or despite our best intentions. It, it, it still touches them and they may be young, but they are strong and they are resilient and they will, you know, when, when life comes at them, they will... You know, they find ways to deal with it, right? Sometimes healthy, sometimes not so much. So, but they don't escape it, which is the bottom line. They don't escape it. As much as we want to build these illusionary forts for them, they, they, life, they cannot avoid life. Yeah. I mean, Marshall, I want, I know, you know, you teach high school. So, with mm-hmm. what Maurice just said, do you want to comment? Because I feel like when we talk off podcast and we talk about, you know, you being a teacher, like, um, I just think a lot about you talk about your students in really good ways and just the things that they go through. So do you just want to vibe off of like just what Maureen said? Yeah. I, you know, I, I taught middle school, but I've been taught, I've taught high school now for 12 years. And I, and what Marie said is absolutely a hundred percent every day. It's these kids are dealing with stuff that you don't see. We don't always have the full picture almost ever until something happens and then it's like, Oh wait, they're dealing with this, this, and this, or I, you know, I I don't want to get into specifics, but I get emails from parents sometimes. And it's like, my student is going through X, Y, and Z right now. Can you please help me? And it's like, those moments are, of course I will say yes. And of course I will do anything. Right. But at the same time, a lot of times I'm, I feel like I'm con- trying to convince students that I actually am there for them. And like, I am a safe person that they can talk to. And that, and I am, I really do care what they're going through. Right. And like, but if they don't tell me, I can't, I don't know. Right. And so I feel like these kids carry these, these, they, they carry so much with them. And I feel like sometimes they don't have to, right. Um, or they, I mean, they, they will still, but they all, they could have more support. Right. And I, and I think, I think that's, you know, and we, we've talked about the usual suspects before, but like, I mean, just that idea of these middle school students going through these things. And it's just like, where can you get help? Where can you, who can you lean on? And this is what I encourage my students all the time. It may not be me there's a student, you know, I live in a very small rural white community, mostly white community. Um, and it's like, I might not be the person to help them, but somebody might be right. And so it's, 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 I don't, I don't really know where I'm going with this, but at the same time, like it's, it's, I couldn't imagine trying to convey that in a story and write from their perspective outside of the fact that I've just seen so many kids go through it. So I I love, I love Maurice, the fact that you're like, Hey, read this. (laughs) <laughs> read this thing I wrote. Do you see yourself kind of thing? And it's like, right. all right, Mr. Broadus, whatever. And like, and you get that little attitude, but then like five years later, 
like for me, like a few years after they graduate, they'll reach back and be like, oh, you know, or they'll talk to my wife locally and be like, oh, Mr. Carr's, you know, he was, he was, he was kind of strict in the classroom teaching English, but, but I really appreciate him more now. And I'm, and tell him I'm sorry for being, being an ass in class, you know, <laughs> kind of thing. And it's like, those are the kind of impacts, like you, it, it may not be there right then, but I, I think it's important that, um, that they know that at, at some point they can appreciate that, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So I don't know. Okay. I'm going to read a section from chapter 10 because I have a lot of feelings on it. And I feel like it again is a, a great chapter and a great little section about voice and just, just, I could just go on about this book, but I'm going to read this chapter 10 first. Okay. Just little section. I'm going to need you to sit down. The officer raises his voice at me like I didn't hear him the first time. Clearly, I'm ignoring him, even though he's busted me before. I can't take him seriously with that stupid patch of squirrel fur along his upper lip wriggling when he talks. <laughs> he towers over me, trying to use his height to intimidate. Two things work against him. One, I'm in middle school. Almost every adult towers over me, so it's just another day that ends in Y. Two, I've had to sit across from school principal Mrs. Fitzgerald. That woman has laser eyes and a nest, an arresting gangsta face. <laughs> After her, no adult scares me. I post up on a stretch of curb. The squad car's lights reflect on my face, blinding me every so often. He calls in a female officer to make sure things don't look funny. The flashing lights, the police, people hovering around, they remind me of the night they took mom away. There's nothing in here that will stick me. There's nothing in here that will stick me, is there? His voice thick and flat with condes cond uh, condescension. The male officer snag, uh, snaps on latex gloves to go through my nap backpack. This is a really good point I want to get to. I'm not a junkie, I tell him. The officer makes a derisive snort. Police assume everyone in the land is a junkie. He piles my change of clothes in the grass alongside my sketch pad and spray cans. A freezer bag holds my toiletries. He dangles it in front of me, maybe wanting to shame me. But I just stare at him. Again, I'm in middle school. I refuse to give a bully power, any power over me. Not knowing what else to do, I begin to reach for my sketch pad. I slow down to assure the officer that I'm not reaching for anything more dangerous than paper. I want everyone to note that part. And so there's no confusion. I fish a willow charcoal stick from the pile, nothing to be confused with a possible weapon. I have so many feelings on that one section. One, it's a reality for kids. It's a reality for middle schoolers. And the way the police officer automatically responds to Bella and to what's in her knapsack. I want to ask Marshall and Nick, this was the first time that you've heard this, of me poorly reading it, sorry. Um, but reading it, is that something you would have thought would have been in a middle grade book? Yes. Yeah. Because I, I mean, yeah, go ahead, Nick. I, I say yes, just because I mean, in the last 10 years, how drastically the landscape has changed on what middle school kids face. Um, so my kids, you know, we have conversations now about school shootings, stabbings, like what you can and cannot bring to school. Like those are viable conversations that we have to have a talk about. We have to have conversations when it pops up in the media, in the news. Um, and I think the worst of it is, is when, when they see, and I'm, I, and I forget eh, on the spot, I'm forgetting the kid's name, but you know, when um, this little child 12 years old was shot over a toy gun. Right. And so it's, we got to talk about K how, how can you like interact with police officers and not, you know, put yourself in a danger based on what they see and not what you're doing. 
Um, so I think that just just the conversation in general has changed drastically over the last 10 years. Conversations that my parents didn't have with me, and they should have. That's my next question for Maurice. So Maurice, I really feel like that, um, do you think Unfatable would have been published? And would you be able to write that scene had it been 10 years ago? <sighs> I mean, I could have written that scene 10 years ago because mm-hmm. um, 10 years ago, is that 2012? Yeah, because mm-hmm. uh, I, I, I think starting in 2008, I think, from 2008 to about 2012, 2013, yeah, I volunteered for a homeless teen ministry. And so I, I worked with homeless teenagers for, for quite a while. And uh, so I listened to their stories. I got to know them. Uh, and so, yeah, I could very easily could have written that scene dozens and dozens of times over, uh, even, even 10 years ago, much less today. Do you think it would have sold 10 years ago? Do you think a publisher would have taken the risk to actually like write, to have that in a book at that time? I would have to say no, only because, I mean, especially in middle grade books, I mean, they're yeah, I can't even think of any books that had people that looked like me uh, on, on the covers or much less inside. So, yeah, 2012, yeah. And cause I think the, the We Need Diverse Books movement, that I think that happened, what, 2015 or so? Yeah, it was so, 2015. Uh, yeah, so I mean, it was still a while before uh, before that even happened. So 2012, I mean, I could have written I- it, but... I know I asked you when we did, when we talked about Sweep of Stars, it's just, I really want people to realize that like, We Need Diverse Books was only in 2015 and we're in 2022. So a lot of these things that we're seeing in publishing are finally starting to happen. And I've said this in other episodes, like you could write um, 40 middle grade books with um, black characters and it still wouldn't be enough. You know, and our publishing industry takes it as like, oh, well, there's that one book that came out and it's like, well, you know, you need different nuances. And for me personally, just reading that scene and what I love as far as voice and as far as the character of Bella is that she is just so authentically her, you know, and that is just so powerful and she's so smart and um, you, that really comes through in that little section that I write that you wrote, that I read. Um, Not that I read. Um, Go ahead, Marshall. Well, I want to circle back because I didn't get to answer part of that question after. uh, And and I want to say Nick's right. But at the same time, um, and and what Marie said too, I mean, look, it may not, it, it may not have been something that would have been published 10 years ago, but that situation that that child is going through has been happening for decades and more okay. right and so like when i was in high school when i was in middle school like the number of times i've been pulled over or pulled aside in public and like you know it it, it that section spoke to me in that i've gone through that you're telling this story now and this is being published now but at the same time you know we're, we have to be able to read these things and realize this is not a new thing. Like there are middle schools, middle schoolers, excuse me, in my little community being searched because they're carrying um, various items, whether it be drugs or, you know, a weapon of some sort or something like that. And that happens at the high school all the time. I mean, you know, but at the same time, which students are the ones being searched? Which students are the ones being searched first? Which ones are the ones that the adults around us, you know, in my, at my site specifically are like, Oh, you know, it's okay. If they carry knives, they need it for work. It's okay. It's like, it's not okay. It's not okay for any one of these children to carry a weapon onto campus, especially when I know that these specific students are ones that are not happy that I am their teacher, for example, and I'll (laughs) leave it at that. But I'm saying like this that section is true. It's happening. And 
uh, uh, yes, it couldn't have been published probably 10 years ago, but it needs to be published now. And I appreciate you, Maurice, for writing it. <laughs> well, I, I remember that when the first times I was uh, ever, uh, uh, let's see, it was it was late at night. I was walking home from school. A cop pulls pulls over, and I'm literally, I'm just walking. And he pulls me over to do the whole stop and frisk thing. And I'm like, well, what I do, officer? Da, da, da. He's just like, well, you match the description mm-hmm. of someone who robbed something here uh, not too long ago. And I was like, I match the description. Mm-hmm. I am five foot six, barely 100 pounds, and I'm wearing a fucking cape. <laughs> I was going, to be fair, I was going through a phase where I thought I was Batman. It was, it was a strange thing. I kind of... <laughs> I was pretty convinced I was Batman. And so I was wearing capes like everywhere I went. I love um, it. it was a very strange uh, part of my senior year. Uh, I'm just like, what description went out that said, be on the lookout for a short black kid wearing a cape. Right. And he just sort of stared at me, but I'm just like, I, where, where are we right now? Yeah. Um, and that was, and that was me as a, as a senior in high school. That would have been like, what, 1986, 1987, somewhere in there. Yeah. And the match the description thing, I mean, I mean, half dozen times or more, it's like, I match the description. Is that why you pulled me over? I match the description. There's only one part of that description that makes any sense. Right. <laughs> and I'm not wearing a cape in that instance. <laughs> right. You know, just this conversation too, and maybe we want to edit this part out, Marshall, but what I'm about to say, but it kind of goes with what we're talking about. I used to steal cars when I was a kid, right? And I was so good at it because I was a raving homosexual, okay? And I looked so gay and I was so white that no one even noticed me. They just wouldn't even think I was stealing the cars. (laughs) But the minute any of my friends that were like, black or hispanic automatically they were like getting caught and they're like what the hell so everyone started getting it have will steal the cars <laughs> it worked <laughs> i think we can it leave worked. that in i think that no, fits no, the conversation. <laughs> uh, we need to delete that part i'm not having will be arrested for auto theft it's not be <laughs> because of the podcast of oh him admitting, <laughs> admitting guilt i was i went to juvie for it though nick yeah, he's he's oh, done his okay. time. If you've already been caught in the time, my, that's fine. Yeah, I I paid I paid my time, but those records are sealed and ex- expunged. <laughs> oh, I love it. So I, Marsha, I kind of want to bring back and, and for Maurice as well, like kind of this whole topic in like middle school and like the dumb shit that like we have to do, um, and and things that we see. So me from middle school was is probably rougher than I care to imagine or or to remember but we had a lot of bomb threats like i can't tell you how many bomb threats we had my seventh grade year we actually had a kid actually light off a bomb on new year's eve one night and and blew the entry entry doors off the school sounds like you but i remember (laughs) it was washington state thank you um mr i want to hate on utah right now (laughs) uh so but (laughs) <laughs> but it's Washington State. Thank you, guys. Um, it was funny, though. Not, And it's not funny. Let me rephrase that. It was different, though, because when people started becoming, quote, unquote, suspects. Right. The, the one white kid that became a suspect at that point was the one white kid that only hung out with the Hispanic kids. Mm. You know? And so you, you bring that up. And I'm like, man. And then you bring up the knives, right? Having to be frisked before you get into school. I remember. Oh, hey, he works on the farm. Of course, he's going to have a knife on him. Right. Oh, hey, no, you can't have that ring on because that can be used as a weapon. Right. You know, the di- the difference there, making something out of nothing. And it, it didn't affect me as a kid. I didn't see it as a kid. But now looking back, like, I, I think. You know, all this stuff was happening so long ago, but no one was ready to talk about it. Right. Well, um, so, I don't want to be that guy, but we do need to wrap up. Because oh, yeah, we're I actually two questions. 
almost an hour over Maurice's time that we allotted for him. <laughs> and I want to respect well, uh, well, well, his time. We all know we all know we scheduled three hours for this, right? No, we scheduled two as we a normal He's human person would do. Yeah, I scheduled three two. <laughs> okay, all right, fair enough. <laughs> I, I was told I was told two one hour sessions. All right, fair enough. Yeah, um, that's why I scheduled well, three because I know how our sessions <laughs> yeah. go. So all right, all right I have so two questions. Two yeah, questions, okay. Um well this is three, maybe, because it's a two part answer for this question. <laughs> Unfatable is really at heart a detective story. Yes. You know, like it's a it's a mystery. And Bella is the detective. So I want to know. Um how was it writing those plot beats of a mystery in a middle grade? Do you think there's a difference of writing plot beats in a middle grade mystery versus plot beats maybe of saying like an adult mystery that maybe you're toying with in your head? Um, and the next question is, are we going to see more Bella? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the plot beats... Um... So I really love mysteries. Mysteries... Uh, actually, I, I really love crime fiction, period. And so that's actually that uh, my, my relaxation read uh, used to be just crime fiction. I'm just, you know, that's why I'm a bit big into Elmore Leonard and, and folks like that. I just love crime fiction. And so, uh, in fact, that was actually one of the things I was trying to do is like, can I do like Walter Mosley for kids? That, that was that was my goal with Usual Suspects and my goal with Unfatable. You know, can I do Walter Mosley for kids? Um, so, so, so there's that. So, but uh, the the plot beats and, and and that sort of thing that the, the trickiest part about the plot beats and, and for for mystery with middle schoolers has been the fact of uh, well in fact the reality how, however you want to phrase this is uh, that middle schoolers are just as smart as they can be they are also just messy and so they're it's usually when they try to do strategic thinking that the uh, some of the, their plans go awry. Uh, which I always love writing. I, I, I my favorite part is always them thinking they've come up with some clever plan and it just going the way of middle school plans. Uh, you know, so uh, that's one of my favorite things. Uh, but yeah, the actual the the the, the beats and everything that I, I love that. I'm I see you caught me at a bad time because like right I'm no I'm I know I'm on deadline. Uh, supposed to be writing the sequel to Sweep of Stars, and I got this sci-fi trilogy I'm supposed to be writing, and da da. But dang God, if the idea, I also, so I've been binging. Look here, I'm, I'm, since it's just us right now, <laughs> uh, I, I've been binging uh, British cozy mysteries lately, uh, and I'm oh, man, I've just been going through so many of these things. I'm on like my third series in a row. I'm not, I mean series, so like. I went through Midsummer Murders, all 20 seasons. I went through <laughs> uh, all 10 seasons of Death by Beth in Paradise. I'm in like season six of Father Brown Mysteries. I've been just binging these mysteries. And so like in the back of my head, I'm also going, you know, there is there is a British cozy mystery series I would love to write. Uh. And so, so like, so now, the, so that's going on in the back of my head too, which hopefully my agent or my editors won't hear me, you know, say <laughs> that, you know, these are things twirling around in the back of my head. Um, because I do, I just love mysteries and I, uh, and I, I would love my hand at, you know, just doing more of them. Um, and especially the big difference between writing Bella versus writing uh, Thelonious and Nehemiah and Unusual Suspects is Bella is actually tr a trained investigator. Right, so she fell under the, the she she fell you know fell into training with an actual investigator, so she's actually trained to do this, so or being trained to do this at, at a, as an actual investigator. So, uh, so how she comes at these problems and new problem solvings? Yeah, she you know stretches a bit because she's a middle schooler, but you know she she actually has some training to do this, and so that's a long way to go. Oh man, I'd love to write more Bella mysteries. <laughs> so. Make it happen. I think, it happen, I, I think I'm here for that. And right. for the record, your social media accounts have documented your cozies that you've been uh, watching. <laughs> so I don't know if this is news to anyone, but you're thoroughly <laughs> enjoying it to post about it. Okay. <laughs> that's, you know what? Fair. <laughs> I keep acting like only like six people see my Twitter. So it's just like, it's just us, it's just us on Twitter. <laughs> That's hilarious. 
All right. So my next question, and I guess I'll relieve something for off the podcast that I'm going to ask Maurice. Um, it's an idea I just had. Um, I won't put you on the spot. Um, okay. What keeps you writing and engaged with middle grade fiction? Mm. So, oh man. So, so middle grade fiction and my job at the middle school like really go hand in hand. So it used to be what tied me to it. Like when I was writing Usual Suspects was the fact that my boys were in middle school. Uh, and, and so just chronicling their adventures, you know, it sort of kept me to it. Uh, but, you know, now my youngest is 19 and my oldest is 20. You know, they, they're not having middle school adventures. Although to be fair, before my youngest graduated high school, uh, let's let's just say I have basically three volumes of Usual Suspects planned, or I mean sketched out, because he gave me that much material to work with. Um, I, I remember when we finally pulled him out of public high school during a senior year, because he began the year with, so I've declared war on the following teachers, and I'm like, well, oh, and boy. that's a wrap, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. That's that's we're not doing this. <laughs> we are not doing this. Um. <laughs> so, uh, but what keeps me engaged now is is my middle school students in my classrooms each day, because uh, you know I, I I I tend to talk a lot about archetypes, um, but like each year in my classrooms, like in, with the usual suspects, each year there's a new Thelonious and there's a new Nehemiah and there's a new version of a lot of the cast of, of characters I wrote in in, in usual suspects. You know, as I each year when I, uh, you know, I, I look for, you know, the next Bellas uh, the, or, or the, the new other characters, because I'm just like, yeah, there they are. They're smart. They're curious. Uh, they're powerful. They're magical. I get, you know, each year, I, you know, I love looking at my students through those, through the, that lens, through those set of eyes of just like seeing their potential and their, and, and again, their power, their agency. And, and, uh, and, and seeing how they, the messy process of them muddling through and figuring it out for themselves. I mean, I, that's what keeps me engaged as a teacher. And then that's what keeps me engaged, you know, just telling those sort of stories. So, so if I ever lost, uh, if I ever lost my job or, or moved on from my job, uh, you know, would I still be as engaged? I don't know if I would, because the, the two, I think, are inextricably li- uh, linked. So, Amazing. Well, Maurice, again, thank you. So, so much for joining us again for whatever time, however many times we determined at the beginning of the episode (laughs) when we did the math, we really appreciate (laughs) it. Um, And just in case this is somebody's first time listening to the episode, where can people find you on the internet? Because that is important for people to know. And it'll be in the show notes as well. Absolutely. You can find me at uh, mauricebroadus.com. My website has recently been redesigned uh, by by a group of young people. I I'm never afraid to just turn stuff over to young people and see what they can come <laughs> up with. Um, so uh, uh, MauriceBroadus.com. And then you can find me on all all the major platforms as Maurice Broadus, except for TikTok. No, oh, don't do it. Because, don't do it, Maurice. Well, so no, my, my wife, my agent, and Bella, as a matter of fact, the, the real life Bella, all basically had an intervention that said, Mr. Broadus, you do not need to be on TikTok. Uh, we don't want to see you there. I made, literally, I made one joke about doing the bus it challenge, and they were like, uh-uh, no, 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 we're not doing I, this. Look, I'm here for it. I support <laughs> you. <laughs> and I would exactly. create your account for you if I need, if need be. Oh, it's there. It's just I haven't posted anything because they won't <laughs> let me. Look, I'll say this. If you were to start building a brand on TikTok based on one of your books... <laughs> Plenty of other people do it. <laughs> no, Plenty don't, of don't others do it. We well, have no, next support, okay. apparently. <laughs> you got my support. I follow other authors that are hilarious on there. I think you'd fit in. <laughs> don't tell your wife I said that. Right? <laughs> That's All hilarious. Right. Well, thanks again, Maurice. We appreciate it. Thank you. You are so welcome. So welcome. <laughs>
And this has been Just Keep Writing, a podcast for writers, by writers, to keep you writing. You can find us at justkeepwriting.org. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Feel free to reach out to any of us on our social medias, and please jump in our Just Keep Writing Discord channel. Links to all of that is in the show notes. Lastly, please support our show by going to patreon.com slash justkeepwriting. We offer daily writing prompts, early access to podcast episodes, and much more. Thanks for listening, and just keep writing.